get that shirt to come up? Just like Uncle Sam, we want your money. <laughs> Brother Carl, will you lead your prayer? see this number of prisons so many people that we have sick uh, but we thank you for the ones that's here today also we appreciate the ones that took part in our um, meals on wheels or we call it our love feast uh, but we appreciate all the ones that worked in that and carried out food for the ones and shed ins of people we hope that uh, helped bless a lot of people this week so we thank you and we praise you for doing that I uh, also like to mention most of you know that uh, the death of Mr. Marshall Dixon we don't know any information yet. Uh, I'd called Tim this morning, and is, uh, they're back home. They will stay there late last night, but they're back home. Miss Yvonne's at home, and if anybody wants to go by and visit them, or eat their food for right now, she's at her house. As far as I know, we don't know any information right now because the family hadn't met. We don't know any other information at this time. But uh, remember those are lost of one, one beside Mother Marshall Dixon. 
We have the Cowart family and uh, also Tiny Barner be buried today and the funeral will be at Patterson, I believe, at 2.30. And uh, Miss Davis, I was three. They've had funerals in Patterson Baptist Church this week and there's a lot of other funerals around. So just remember the ones that's lost of loved ones this week. There's several, several more people and also the ones that's on our sick list. We have a lot of people. But I'd like to bring to your attention at this time, if you have your bulletins, and thank you, Ms. Donna, for bringing this to our attention about calling your congressman, also your representative on this late-term abortion, be voting on tomorrow. And uh, it says several things. It's in the, in the back of your bulletin. I hope that you read your bulletin. And uh, it tells you where to call, the number to call. Also, if you want to send an email, it's very important to let people know how you stand because God will hold us responsible for the abortions in this country. And uh, in this statement it says, uh, what shameful distinction does uh, the United States share with North Korea, Vietnam, China, and also Canada and the Netherlands and Singapore? I believe, can y'all see that writing? I'm gonna read a little bit for you anyway. Uh, it's one of the only seven countries to allow abortion after 20 weeks of pregnancy called the late-term abortion. This has been at the head of the line for years in our country about the president has been for it, the president has been against it. Well, I know whenever Clinton was in office, the Republicans brought him a bill to stop this late-term abortion, and he held up his pencil. He says, I will veto this, and he signed the death warrants of millions and millions of babies. You think God might hold him responsible? He will. And not only that, he's going to hold responsible this country for allowing people like that to squat upon the thrones of our country. We have it now again, coming back up, this late-term abortion. And it says as many as 25,000 pre-born babies are aborted after 20 weeks in this country each year. This bill would prohibit the majority of these abortions. According to the medical evidence, there is strong possibility that these pre-born children are able to experience pain from 20 weeks later. The abortion at this point in the pregnancy are committed by dismembering the baby's bodies in the mother's womb. Most of the time, the babies are turned around. And far as our great Supreme Court judges in our country, a baby is not a person until the head is out of the mother's womb. That's the reason they turn the babies around. They born feet first, they leave the head in, they take a knife and cut the back of the head, and they suck the brains out. How many people voted for that in our country? Well, you got a chance to do something about it by contacting your senators to stop this and let them know. I say you have the information on the back of your bulletins, who to call, email, God will hold us responsible for this type of murder in our country. And everybody that supports this stuff, God will hold them responsible. God is already judging our country. So I hope that we'll do what the right thing is and call our representatives and our senators to stop this kind of murder in our country. Amen. And I don't believe there's a person in here as far this type of abortion or any type of abortion. So I appreciate it. And thank you. And hope we'll do what we should do in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what we can do is do what's right, Brother Orville.
it is, isn't it? What a wonderful day. What a day it will be when we get there. So let's just remember that. Amen, and that beautiful singing, what a day that will be. Because <clears throat> one of these days we'll all we'll be taking a trip with Jesus Christ. So we just want to thank the Lord. What a day that will be. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And also that other song, uh, that, that name, that beautiful name, that's what I'm going to be preaching on tonight, the name, or this morning, the name of Jesus Christ. He is our high priest, touching on a little bit of it last week. <clears throat> And he is our great high priest. What a name, what a name that Jesus Christ is. Uh, the title of our message tonight, this morning, is really qualified for the job. Uh, Hebrews 5, 1 through 10, qualified for the job. We really need to know where we at in the book of Hebrews. Remember, the Hebrew book was wrote to the Hebrew Christians. Uh, let them know that Jesus Christ is better, better than anything in the Old Testament, better than the prophets, better than the angels, better than any of the old priesthood, <clears throat> that Jesus Christ is better. Really, the Hebrew book was wrote to the Hebrews, was telling the Hebrews, quit being Hebrews, to be Christians. And I know that a lot of you have been on vacation and uh, on vacation, a lot of time you stop and you cross another state. You stop in what they call the information center. And a lot of time they'll have a map of the state posted outside and uh, they'll have a red dot. This is where you are. 
Well, this is the red dot in the book of Hebrews of where we are in the book of Hebrews, and Jesus Christ is better than anything <clears throat> in the Old Testament economy, better than anything they had in the tabernacle or the temple worship, that Jesus Christ is better, and he fulfilled everything in the Old Testament time for the prophets all the way through the tabernacle, also the temple. So the Hebrew is to the Hebrew Christians, the Jews, telling them they're under pressure, as we know what pressure is today, but they're under pressure to go back into the old economy, to go back to that old temple worship and keep going back. This book was wrote to them to tell the Jews do not go back, and also they have been, he has been explaining that you need to go on because Jesus Christ is better. In every way, he is better for you to go on. Same thing today. Christian today, the New Testament time for us to go on. There's a lot of people has turned back. A lot of Christians have turned back into the old way of life. Come for a while and they turn back and turn away from Jesus Christ and, and his great economy in life. And they go back into old way of life and the dead life that they come out of. And same as the Jews, they wanted to go back in this old way of economy of the Old Testament and the priesthoods. Jesus Christ is better. Don't go back. It's just an old way. It's a dead religion. It's like our old life, every one of us. If you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, <clears throat> people quit serving. They quit worshiping. They quit coming. They keep re quit reading. They keep praying. They and their family is away from church. They're going back into a dead life. This book is to give us encouragement to go on in Christ Jesus. You're saved. Now you go on to be everything that Christ has intended us to be. And we have a comparison <clears throat> in these verses of Scripture from 1 to 10, a comparison of the earthly priest and our heavenly high priest, which is Jesus Christ. Is he qualified? Is Jesus Christ qualified, according to the Bible, to be our great high priest? It was explaining this in this word to the Jews, to the Hebrew Christians, how Jesus Christ is much better, and he's qualified to be their high priest. And for us to understand this, the contrast starts off in verse 1 through 4 is the Old Testament earthly high priest, and how we have a contrast between that high priest and all of his qualification and Jesus Christ in the Bible and Jesus Christ's qualification to be our great high priest. <clears throat> Now, no priest or high priest in the Bible was called a great high priest. Only Jesus Christ. I covered a lot of this last week. Only Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the only one in the Jewish economy or the Jewish system that held all three of the appointed and anointed offices of the Old Testament economy. He was a prophet, a priest, and a king, as I told you last week. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, he was a prophet. He represented God to man. When Jesus Christ left this earth, going back to the Father, where he's at today, on the right hand, making intercessions for us, what is his title now? Priest. One of these days, the father's going to look over at the son and give him the nod of approval, and he's going to say, go after my children. That is the rapture. When Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, he will be king of kings and lord of lords. In this verse of scriptures in here today, we're seeing now the priest, his position that he has today. We're not studying about the prophet that he was when he walked on this earth. But the position that he has today is your great high priest. 
and how he qualifies to be your great high priest according to the Bible. Here is the earthly high priest, Hebrews 5 and 1, first four verses. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifice for sin. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmities. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sin. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have today to learn more about you, Jesus, and to understand your ministry today is making intercessions for every one of us. We thank you and we praise you for that position in the holies of holies of God in heaven, that every prayer that we offer up, everything we say to you, Jesus Christ, goes through you to the Father on high. We thank you and we praise you for your qualifications here on this earth to be a high priest when you left to go back to heaven. Father, we pray that you might increase our understanding to understand how great that you are. And Father, if a person here today has never accepted you to be their priest and be their Savior, we pray today will be the day of that great salvation to understand that they need a high priest. We thank you and we praise you. Father, for the ones, God, that we have on our prayer list, for those who lost of loved ones, Father, for the Dixon family and others, we thank you and praise you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and amen and amen. As we see the Old Testament, they want to keep going back into that Old Testament economy, into the temple, and also of these sacrifices they made. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that temple tonight in the book of Revelation. As we see that old temple, it's a dead way. Jesus Christ completed all the shatters of the tabernacle and the temple when he was here on this earth. When he died on the cross of Calvary, everything was done. No need for the temple today. So we will understand, we'll find out the temple is going to be built tonight in the book of Revelation chapter 11. Today, whenever people, as Christians today, whenever they stop, just like these Jewish Hebrews did, they stop following Jesus Christ in his grace and mercy for salvation, and they started going back to that old temple and that temple worship, the temple sacrifice. And you today and me today, as a lot of people, as I said, stop worshiping Jesus Christ in the way that God has called us to worship him, and there's only one way, and that's God's way to worship him. When you stop this, you and your family goes back into a dead, dead religion. Going back in this dead religion. As I said, Jesus Christ was a prophet here on this earth. Today he is our priest. He's going to reign and rule one of the days on this earth as kings. Now, Jesus Christ is the only one that ever held in the uh, Hebrew and also the Israelite system, the only one that held all three of these positions or offices. Now, God has separated these. We will call this church and state. God has separated every one of these positions. A king could not be a prophet. A prophet could not be a priest. Everyone was separated. No one man under the Israel system was ever held both of these offices. But you'll find out that Jesus Christ held all three of these offices because he is our great high priest today. Now, the contrast between these two, this earthly priest and this heavenly priest. Now, this earthly high priest, as we look at this earthly high priest, as the Bible says, how that they was qualified, how an earthly high priest was qualified. Remember, they had one high priest. Each year, they had one high priest. And how that he was qualified. Now, Jesus Christ would ask the question now, is he qualified for the job? This is what the Jews was asking. And the answer to whoever penned this Bible, we know it was penned by the Holy Spirit of God, but we do not know who the author penned this book called the Hebrews. But we know that the Holy Spirit of God penned all the Bible. But we don't know what man penned this. But the question was asked, is Jesus Christ qualified to be our great high priest? And here comes the answer. 
You know, a lot of times whenever you seek a job, you know, first thing they ask you if you're qualified. Are you qualified for this job? Well, the qualifications is in for Jesus Christ. Discover he indeed, he is qualified, really, really qualified. He meets the, and exceeds every qualification to be the great high priest. There's three words you look at in verse 1, men, God, and sin. The earthly high priest represented men or people to God. That's what his job was as a high priest. His appointment of this earthly high priest. We're talking now about this earthly high priest. He said that this earthly high priest was taken from among men and ordained for men. Called, ordained for men. He had to be a man among men. In other words, he had to be a human being. He couldn't be an angel. He had to be a human being. Jesus Christ was a man among men. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. He was a God-man, but he was among men while he walked on this earth. But not only that, look at his assignment now. This is an earthly high priest assignment. In verse 4, No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Talking about now this earthly high priest. He was called of God. You did not decide to be a priest. You was called of God. No man takes his honor unto himself because he had to be identified with the people. And the people had to be identified with him. And he had to understand the people because he was called among people. He was called among men. Now the reason the angels could not uh, witness or be a priest or either preach to you today, they do not understand what you and I go through. They do not understand the feelings and the hurt that you and I go through. Angels, one-third of the angels fell from heaven. They will never be redeemed. Angels do no, don't know anything about redemption. When we are redeemed, we are greater than angels in God's creation. Mankind can be redeemed. Angels nowhere in the Bible will ever be redeemed. When they left heaven, Father Luther, one-third of them, they are called demons, and they will never, ever, ever be redeemed. They'll be chained in outer darkness that we'll study in the book of Revelation. They are demons. They do not understand. The angels do not understand what you and I go through today or the redemption plan that God has through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, that's the reason that they cannot preach. They do not understand well, you see, they had to be among men. A priest had to be among men. He had to understand mankind. You know, it's, it's kind of like preachers today. You know, I have the same problem that you do. I have the same feeling. I have the same problem. I get tired just like you do. I have the same problem among men. God called men among men because we understand problem because we are men. I had to pay income tax. Oh, Lord, I shouldn't have said that. I messed up somebody I knew. We, we had to pay. I had to pay. I had to have to do the same thing. Now, the only difference is sometimes, you wives and husbands, <clears throat> youngins, sometimes whenever you get up on Sunday morning, you might have a fuss with your wife or your husband or youngins. And y'all get in a fuss and say, well, I ain't going to church today. And you stay home. Maybe some look like somebody stayed home today. They must have had a fuss. But you know what I have to do? When Joyce gets on to me and maybe we have a fuss, I got to get right and I got to come anyway and preach to you. That's the difference. Still got to preach. How many times in the last 14 years have you been here and I hadn't been here? I hadn't had all roses either. Joyce gets on me a good bit. But we make it by the grace of God. You have to understand, a high priest understands people. They understand people's heartaches. Uh, they understand how people feel, the needs, the suffering, the problems. A high priest did the same thing, called into this. Call is a high priest. As I said, it has a lot to do with pastors. Call of God. You don't decide to be a pastor. I can tell you I'm not a very rich man, but all the money in the world was piled up in front of me. 
what I've been through for the last 30 years, I would not take all the money in the world if I had to go through what I've already been through. You've got to be called of God. You've got to be called of God. Because a pastor, there's problems in churches, y'all know that? And it don't matter which way the problem comes out, he's always the blame. Because there are two sides, one side or the other side, are, are always going to blame the pastor because he's the only one they can blame. The high priest had to know people, had to have their feelings and understand people, had to be called of God. Now it says in verse 1 again, pertaining to God, and they offered gifts and sacrifice for sin. Now this is the earthly high priest. He had offered sacrifice for his own sin because he knew that sin separated between man and God. You know what? We are separated because of our sin between our God and ourself. And it also says in, in uh, Isaiah 59 and 2, but your iniquity have separated between you and your God, and your sins are hid in his face from you that he will not hear. You see that? He will not hear. Whenever we get in the habit of sin, and we live a lifestyle that we know is absolutely wrong and sin, did you know what? You can't pray. God's not going to be the one that understands or he understands your prayer, but he's not going to answer your prayer. He's not going to listen to you if you've got sin in your life because our sin separates us between God. Whenever we lost, we are sinners. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. If you're here today and you have not saved, you are a sinner. All of us, and we see you have separated from God. You can't speak to God. You can't go to God. You have no part with God whatsoever. You need somebody to go to God for you. Who is that somebody? Jesus Christ. He is our great high priest. You need somebody. The sign of the high priest was offer sacrifice for the sins because he knew the sin was a problem and it kept people from God. The problem today keeps us from God. But look at his approach there, and also in verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmities. Well, now his approach. Now that word compassion or compassed is, is not the word normally used that we see in the Bible. It means to measure suffering. It means to measure compassion or a balance of compassion. In the Greek picture, it means a balance between anger and a balance between wrath. As a church, we need a tendency to have a balance of wrath, anger, and also compassion. We usually, most of the time, we would liable to go to extreme one way or the other. The church body is number one, not people, not persons, but this church body is number one. We have compassion for this church body is number one. But we have a tendency sometimes to get out of balance. And I'll tell you, you that have children here today as parents, would you agree with me that sometimes that you get out of balance with your children? You're either too lenient or you're too strict. How many of you parents has made that mistake? And you know, just as sure as you get where you understand how to raise kids, your job's over with. <laughs> just as soon as you get to learn something about the job, you don't have the job no longer. You're too lenient. Or you go to extreme too many different ways. Well, the high priest the same way. Had to have a balance. As a church, we need a balance. Uh, just to relate with sin, but not too hard on sinners. We don't condemn sin. We don't invite all type of sin to be members of our church and people that's living in sinful relationship, to be members of the church because we don't condone it. But yet, they're also just as much loved and needed as God needs and loves every one of us. 
but we don't condone their sin. We need to have this balance. There's two reasons why the high priest is he is qualified of this because of sinners. Be gentle on sinners. He himself also is compassed with infirmity because this is the earthly high priest. How he can understand it? Because he himself, I myself, and that compassion with infirmities means to lie around. It means a chain wrapped around a person. The high priest was wrapped around with the chains of infirmities because of his own weaknesses. I am wrapped around with infirmities with the chains of my own weakness. Y'all know what I mean? Y'all have the same thing that I do? Every one of us here today, we all have these weaknesses in our heart. The high priest, the pastor today, knows what it is to have the physical weakness. Do you know what it is to have physical weakness? I know what it is to have physical weakness. The high priest had to understand this physical weaknesses. If we did not get sick, I was never sick, I would not know how to relate to people that got sick. Uh, me and Joyce and I, I don't know how long we was married, but she come down with a kidney stone. I never had a kidney stone. And she goes complaining about hurting. Ah, oh, it ain't hurting that bad. Come on, let's go. We was working on what we was doing. It was in hay or what a... Oh, come on now, it ain't all that bad. Act like she was hurting. Finally had to carry her to the hospital. Finally had to take a, a surgery and operate and cut it out with a knife. Well, bless your heart, you know, in just a few years, you know what, I had one. And I can assure you mine hurt worse than hers. And it had to cut mine out. But you see, I can tell you now, with any of y'all out there, when anybody said, well, pray for me, I got kidney stones. I know how you feel. That was the position of the high priest. It's also the position of, of pastors. I know how you feel. Now, there's some things I don't know how you feel as you go through. But the things that I have been through, I can tell you, I know how you feel. And a lot of times you have to go through sicknesses, and you wonder what for. Well, there's someone else in trouble, trials and tribulation, maybe loss of loved ones, and Someone else, you see, I, I've never lost a, a, a loved one like some of y'all in here have lost a loved one. I can't go up to anybody and say, I really know how you feel, because I don't. I can have sympathy with them, but I can't say, as some of you can say, like I've never lost one of my children, as some of y'all have. And I can't say, I know how you feel, but some of you can't. I know how you feel. High priest knew how people feel. As we study this, the emotional infirmities, they learn to be gentle. Sin makes us selfish. If you find anybody as a selfish person that puts themselves first, but you can tell you one thing, their life is full of sin and rebellion against God. Against God. Sin makes us selfish. King David, King David was a prime example of this. You know, I don't know about you, but you know what? It's pretty easy for me to see sin in y'all's life or other people's life. Yeah, it's easy for me. It's easy for you to see sin in other people's life, easier than it is for you to see sin in your own life. If you agree with me, do like S. Oh, King David, you know King David? With Bathsheba? He had hundreds of wives and concubines. Hundreds of wives! But yet he chose his leader, Bathsheba. Take her for his wife. And then had her husband killed. That's sex outside the marriage. And I'll tell you, God will deal with sex outside marriage and deal with it severely. For one whole year, old David kept it secret. Everybody knew about it. God sent, oh, prophet of God, 
Old Nathan, I believe it was. Go tell him about it. He said, I want to tell you, King David's on his throne. He said, I want to tell you, he says, uh, about this man. You see, a king had to be judged over the people. He would judge the people's circumstances like courts of law would do today. He said, I want to tell you about this man. This man had a lot of sheep, and uh, he had some company coming in. And instead of killing one of his sheep and barbecuing it for his family to come in, he went over to his neighbor that had one little sheep. And he took that sheep away from that man. And he barbecued that sheep and fed his company. And he had hundreds of sheep. That made David so mad. He was ruling over it. It made him so mad. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll make that man pay back tenfold for what he'd done. But he, the old bony finger of that prophet said, you are the man, David. Because he could see sin in other people's life. And he could not see the sin in his own life. God dealt with David for that type of behavior of sex outside of marriage. You will not get away with it. Then we see this earthly high priest made sacrifice for his own sin. But now we go to the heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ. Man, I got to hurry. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. Talk about Jesus now. Who needeth not daily as those high priests in the Old Testament to offer up sacrifice first for their own sin and then for the sins of the people. This Jesus Christ, he did once on the cross of Calvary. Then he offered up himself. So we switch to the contrast. Now, Jesus only done it one time. The high priest had to do it every year, every year, every year, every year. It did not take away sin. It just rolled it over to Calvary. But Jesus, one time, done it one time. And verse 5 says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That is quotation from Psalm 2 and 7. Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. This is not his birth. This is not Jesus Christ's birth, I have begotten thee. Jesus Christ became a high priest, not at his birth. Not at his birth. When? His resurrection, when he went back to heaven. This is not referring to his priestlyhood when he says, I begotten thee as his birth, but ever he descended back to heaven. And also in that same chapter, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Here it is, the key is endless life. The high priest lived and they died. They lived and they died. They lived and they died. Jesus Christ will ever live forever as our high priest. He'll never die. I will never die. How Jesus Christ was selected and appointed. Jesus Christ, as I said on earth, he never ministered as a priest. He never ministered as a priest living on this earth. He never functioned on this earth as a priest. Verse 6 of this chapter that I have read. As he said also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, who in the world, Melchizedek? That is a quotation from Psalms 110 and 4. Now, here the writer of Hebrew dropped a bombshell on the listers of the Hebrew at that time. Who in the world is Melchizedek? Man, they went turned through their Bible. Who is Melchizedek? Jesus Christ is after this order. In other words, who is this man? Well, he come with a different order. Jesus Christ did with a different order. The Old Testament selection of priests had to come through Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest. And all the priests of all the time had to come in the family of Aaron. The Levites in the family of Aaron 
had to be born a priest. But now Jesus Christ is a different order. Who is this man Melchizedek of Jesus Christ after this order? Well, in Genesis chapter 14, well, Genesis is really the seed chapter. There's a law that you need to understand when you read in Genesis. It is a law of first occurrence. And whatever is said and done in the book of Genesis, I followed all the way through the scripture and it never changed. I could go forever talking to about this situation. But uh, you remember in Genesis chapter 14 when Abraham and Lot, they separated. Lot chose uh, Solomon and Gomorrah, moved in with his family. Well, at that time, there's a bunch of little small kingdoms and they, you know, all the kings of around, they made war with one another. Well, the kings come up against the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they beat them kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and old Lot was in there, and they took him and his family off as slaves. Well, Abraham heard about that. He gathered his family, which he had a kingdom of himself. His family and his servant was a mighty army in itself, and he went after those kings, and he whipped them kings, and he beat those kings, and took over Sodom and Gomorrah, and carried away Lot, his nephew, and you know what? He let him go and brought him back. Now, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. And on the way back, after he had whipped those kings, and it says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. Here this man now, Melchizedek, has two offices. This never happened in the occurrence of the Israelite people. He had two offices, king and priest. Israel never did that. At verse 6 in our same chapter that we've been reading, as it said, also in another place thou art a priest, Forever after the order of Melchizedek. Forever. Forever. You see, before the priesthood in the Jewish economy ever come into existence, this is before all that. Melchizedek was a priest before the priesthood of Aaron, and Jesus Christ was after this priesthood. And he lives forever. Like I said, the, the priests were human beings, and they live and they die, and they live and they die, and they live and they die. Jesus Christ ever liveth to make intercessions for us. But now i like for you to look at his suffering, see if he's qualified. In verse 7 of this Hebrews, chapter 5 and 7, who in the day of his flesh, Jesus Christ on this earth, when he had offered up prayers. Now this carries us to dark Gethsemane and on his prayers who offered up prayers and supplication with strong cryings, this is Jesus now, and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Here's Jesus Christ praying in Gethsemane before the cross. Now, what was he praying? He was praying unto the Father who was able to save him from death. And he said it was heard. Now listen very careful. He was heard. Jesus Christ was not praying to deliver from the death of the cross because he died anyway, did he not? It says he was heard. It's not talking about his death on the cross. But praying to one to save him out of death. You getting the picture? Three days later, his prayer was answered. Out of death. Not from the death of the cross. He come to do, Father, your will be done. He was going to the cross. He said, I'm going to the cross. It's not me, it's, your, it's not my will, it's your will. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to do what you told me to do. I'm going to die. Then he prays, Lord, save me from death. Not the death of the cross, but save me out of death. And he did. Three days later, he heard that prayer, and the prayer was answered that Jesus Christ was saved out of death to die no more. To die no more. From out of resurrection morning, three days later, he got up and walked out. He was saved out of death. Verses 8 and 9 of the same chapter of Hebrews, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things 
which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Very careful. Listen now. We go from Gethsemane to Calvary in the verse of Scripture I just read. And it said that Jesus Christ was made perfect. Does that mean that Jesus Christ had any imperfection in his life? No, because that word perfect don't mean that perfection. That word means qualifications and qualified. That he was qualified, the perfect qualification for being your high priest and my high priest. And also he says, the author of eternal salvation. Did you know that's the only type of salvation that God offers you is eternal? Not part-time, not 10-year salvation, not 20-year salvation, not 5-year salvation, but eternal salvation. And listen to what these words says. Eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Now, if you want eternal salvation this morning and you're lost, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to obey Jesus Christ. It is to all mankind, I'll give you eternal salvation, but you're going to have to obey Jesus Christ. What does obeying Jesus Christ mean? Come just like you are. You are a lost sinner, and you recognize that there's nothing that you can do to be saved. Your sins will separate you between God, and there's no way that you can reach a holy God. Nothing that you can do. There's nothing in you that ever calls you to want to be saved. Jesus Christ has got to work on you first. To woo you and to pull you and let you know that you're a sinner. You don't want to decide to be saved. And there's nothing that you do to be good enough to be saved. You cannot approach God no way whatsoever if you're a lost person. You cannot approach God. Nothing that you can do. On this thing that he will hear, Lord, I'm a lost, doomed, and damned sinner on my way to hell. And there's nothing I can do and I need a Savior. That's whenever Jesus Christ steps in. Jesus Christ steps in and say, I'll be your go-betweener. You see, because we need somebody. Somebody with the feelings you know that we are, as Jesus Christ had. He was a man, a real man. And he can get God by one hand and you and I by the other hand. And here is the bridge. It's called Calvary, the cross of Jesus Christ. And join you and a holy God together through Jesus Christ. There's no way that you can come in contact with this holy God except through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the only way. No man comes to the Father, what? But by me. Anybody can try all they want to, but that's all they're going to do is try. They will never make it to a holy God, and they will not be saved. they got to come. Jesus Christ's way. You've got to obey what Jesus Christ says. I paid the price for you. You was on the slave block of sin, and I bid, and I outbid Satan for your life. And all you've got to do is accept it. It's a free gift. Do you understand it's a free gift? You don't keep yourself saved after you're saved either. You don't want to go back in that old dead way of life and start living that away. You want to go on in Christ Jesus. The encouragement for not just the Hebrews, but encouraged for all mankind today that Jesus Christ is our great high priest and he's better than anything this world has to offer. And one of these days, Jesus Christ to be the only name that you really need in the name of Jesus Christ. I like that song they sung about Jesus Christ. He's better. And I'll tell you what, he's better. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, we're going to give you an opportunity to find out this morning. All you have to do is come forward. Confess your sins, not to the church, but to Jesus Christ. And you know what? He'll forgive you. And no matter what you've done, how that you live, you know what? He says, I have all power in heaven and earth to forgive sin. It don't matter what you do. God can, can forgive you. But you've got to do the same thing he said. You've got to ask him, and you've got to confess. Now, confessing, and a lot of people think it's confessing is, well, I'm just sorry for what I'm doing. I'm sorry for the way I'm living. I'm living outside the really the laws of God. I'm sorry for the way I'm living, and God's going to forgive you. No, sir, that's not, that is not confession. 
You can't confess and keep living in a lifestyle that you know that's contrary to the Word of God. Confession is that I'm going to turn about face and I'm going to get out of that lifestyle and I'm going to walk this way. I'm not going to walk that way no longer. I'm going to quit because you cannot repent if you continuously live in a lifestyle of sin. You cannot repent and be forgiven. When they asked you to come, I confess my sins. And that's saying the same thing about sin that God says. You need to be about face about your sins and bring them to Jesus. And you know what? He is just and forgive your sins. And he will. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad of that? That he will forgive your sins. Oh God, we need that so bad. Thank you for the high priest. Now as we come to the song of invitation, I tell you what, Jesus Christ is a better high priest I'm glad that we don't have to come to church and bring uh, some type of animal to sacrifice. And then, you know, we couldn't even come all the way in because, you see, you couldn't go in the temple. You, you was all not allowed to go into the temple. You had to have a priest to offer up that sacrifice for you. You couldn't even do that. You couldn't go into the, to the holy place. You had to be a priest. And then all the priesthood, there's only one man was chosen to be the high priest. Only him can go in where God was supposed to be dwelling at and what they call the holies of holies. And you know, and the high priest went in, and far as we know in the word of God, went in to the holy of holies with blood and never said a word. And he never sat down. He done his priestly work, quiet, not a word before God, and he got out of the holy of holies. Our great high priest sat down on the right hand of the Father on high. Instead of being quiet, he's ever speaking for us. All of our prayers, all of our desires, all our wants is all folded up in going through Jesus Christ. What a great high priest we have as we stand and sing this song. If God has spoke to your heart about this great high priest, I hope you come forward this hour. Young or old, it's not knowing about Jesus Christ, it's knowing Jesus Christ. See, you don't have a plea before God except I'm a guilty sinner. As you know, church membership will not save you. Baptism will not save you. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ called eternal salvation. God has spoken to you and everybody in this building know for sure without a shadow of doubt. If God will speak to you right now and stop your heart from beating, then you know without a shadow of doubt. Young and old, no matter who you are here today, then you know for sure that you'd open your eyes and see Jesus. Be in a place called heaven, do you know for sure without a shadow of doubt? Well, there may be some young people here today and say, well, I got plenty of time. Yeah, I believe what you're saying, preacher, and I'll get right one of these days. I got some wild oaks I used to call to sow and I get ready, I get an old person, you know I'll settle down, I'll quit doing these things I'll quit living in this type of way when I get older you don't know if you're going to get older you don't know if you're going to make it next week you see there's car wrecks on the roads every day God bless you and thank you. I have a high priest. Do you have a high priest? And his name is Jesus Christ. And I thank him all the time because of the qualification he has and give me permission and responsibility that I can pray. Not just for myself, but for other people. And without my high priest, you would not be able to pray. 
You might love your family. You might love your wife. You might love your husband. You love your kids. You love your grandkids, your great-grandkids. But I tell you, but if you're lost, you cannot pray for them. Jesus is the only way to pray through. I don't like that, preacher. I didn't write it. Jesus says, I am the only way. You need a Savior. God bless you. We thank you here this morning for the blessings. Invite somebody to be back with us tonight. Love you.